Good morning, everyone. What an exciting uh, morning to be surrounded by so many people excited about the topic of um, innovations in women's health. So my name is Susie Gunn. I'm a partner at, at Catalyst Advisors. Um, we specialize in executive and board recruitment for innovative life sciences companies. And I'm thrilled to be joined by um, our fellow sponsors. Um, JP Morgan, Lightstone Ventures, as well as Goodwin, G2G Consulting. Um, and uh, as an overview, um, I think that we would be able to have an opportunity to hear from esteemed panelists across two major topics today that will be moderated by my colleague, um, Christina Isaacson over at Lightstone Ventures. The first topic will, for the panel will be the evolution of investment paradigm in innovations um, for, the, for the health of women. Second topic, we'll be partnering with the government to accelerate innovations for health of women. Before we pass it over to the panelists, um, I would like to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Coleman. Um, I've had the, the pleasure of getting to know Elizabeth over the last few months. Um, really come to admire her um, as a compassionate physician, a dancer, and also a super fun mom to her kids. Um, in addition to being a fit practicing physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering, caring for patients suffering from uh, breast cancer, she's also an assistant professor of medicine at uh, Cornell Medical College. She earned her undergrad degree in the history of science um, uh, from Harvard um, University and also her medical degree from Harvard Medical School. And she completed her residency in internal medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital and her fellowship in oncology at um, the Memorial Sloan Kettering, where she practices today. Um, it is absolutely an honor and a privilege to be able to have Elizabeth speak through her first book, All in Her Head, The Truth of Lies Her Medicine Taught Us About Women's Body and Why That, that Matters Today. The book will be available as of February 13th which um, thanks to our sponsors, all attendees today will be receiving a copy on um, the mail. Yay. Uh, there you go, very nice. Thank you for this evening. I'm so excited to be here um, and see all of you here today. So let's get started because I know Christina says we've got to be right on time. So we can be on time. So, I think a good doctor knows how to stay in their lane. They know what they know, and they know what they don't know. And I'm in this crowd today of deal makers and biotech and venture capital, of which, honestly, I don't know much about. But when it comes to women's health, I've taken care of thousands of women with breast cancer. And the thing about oncology is it really gives you a window into women's health and the questions that really matter to them, what brings them joy, what causes them pain, and what's held them back over the years. And it's not just about their cancer, but their experience with illness. And in that, I've been privy to truly heartbreaking stories of women being dismissed, of having pain unaddressed, and really feeling unactualized in their health for so many reasons. And that is what profoundly led me to write this book. And not surprising, this came in part from the SVP report that maybe some of you saw, but so many women go to the doctor and feel dismissed, or we talk about this word gaslit, or that their concerns were not heard or they felt blamed for whatever medical concern that they had. And this is widely more common among women than men. Why is that? And it leads us, you know, it's 2024 right now and so many of us have had these New Year's resolutions and whatnot, but it makes me think of these 10 step, 12 step self-care moments that we all fall into, these traps of trying to feel better about ourselves, trying to feel better in our health. But what are we really missing along the way? So maybe have any of you seen this cartoon about like executives and the rise to power in, in, um, <laughs> in, in every field, right? But so I saw this, this really resonated for me in academic medicine, but it also made me think about the history of women's health, right? We're all trying to feel good and healthy in our bodies, but what are the things that we're missing? What's the equivalent of the laundry and the cooking and all the emotional labor that we do at home as moms in some instances. What are, what's the equivalent in the history of medicine? What's the legacy that we've inherited when we go to the doctor's office today? Insidious roots that maybe hold us back 
and hold the system back from giving us the best possible care. And it really made me think about, you know, when you think about our wellness industry, mm -hmm. and some of you may be doing these deals, it's tens of billions of dollars mm -hmm. on supplements and all these alternative care. But why is that? Why is it primarily marketed towards women? So this is an advertisement from 1896 of the famous guy, Pierce Pleasant Pellets. It's, you know, whatever the equivalent of the market that I can't say here for compliance reasons. But <laughs> quite often the doctor is, this is from an quite often the doctor is too busy and too hurried to make the necessary effort to obtain the facts. He frequently treats symptoms for whatever they appear to be on the surface when the real cause and the real sickness is deeper and more dangerous. And then of course he goes on to say that it's because we're women. <laughs> but the point here is really that even the beginning of that resonates with many patients today. You feel rushed, you feel unheard, the doctor isn't actually listening to what's going on with you. And of course, it's not surprising that women are searching for answers. They have caretakers in their home, they want to take care of themselves, and they fall down this trap of, well, too good to be true. How can we in this room, how can medicine do better? So what actually gets marketed to women? Now, these are some ads from the past, but you could translate them to the present. In the interest of time, I didn't find their contemporary parts, but we could. So on the left is an ad from the 1930s for a certain mineral salt because, well, constipation is going to make you not beautiful and beauty and health are related. So let's make sure you're going every day. And these hysterical <laughs> women um, should really try Lydia Pecan's vegetable compound because if you're, so if you're crying, you're sobbing, you're laughing, you have no control of yourself. But this simple remedy has benefited me and eight of 100 women. I love you too. And what about here on the right? Lysol. Did you know that Lysol was marketed as a vaginal douche for years? Yes, true. This is just, I could do a whole talk about just Lysol. Okay. <laughs> and what was this woman? She was the jewel of a wife, just one flaw. She was guilty of the one neglect that mars many marriages. Lysol helps avoid this. Okay. Now, one of many acts. <laughs> so where we're gonna be, where did, how did we get here in this contemporary view of medicine? Well, one of the interesting things about medicine is that doctors, it was not always this field that was so revered at all. In the 1800s and really prior, this ancient concept of humorism really dominated how we treated and thought about the body. Well, there were four humors, blood, black bile, phlegm, yellow bile. And it was this imbalance of humors that would cause illness, hence bloodletting, if you, know, you were sick in some instances. But over the course of the 1850s and beyond, germ theory arose, believing that germs were actually causing illnesses. And there was the rise of a new medical science. Well, what happened in that is that women who were, in some instances, the primary caregivers of other women in the home or in the village were pushed out, the midwives were pushed out, and doctors, this field of gynecology started to take over medicine. And there was a fragmentation of medicine in the 19th century with the rise of specialties like neurology, cardiology, gastroenterology. None of this really existed in the form that we had today. And all of that became the codification of medical schools and women increasingly and obviously excluding from this, excluded from this incredibly important information. But when you start to fragment the body, what happens? Well, Think of in part the queen medicine that women's health is breasts and our vaginas somehow only. And if you look at the history of urology, for example, urology, the urologic association was founded in 1902. And think about urology today. Think about women as patients. You think about, do you think about female physicians in that field? Most of us don't. You think it's a male primary driven field. But the reality is that there are many urologic conditions that women suffer from. Predominantly, they go woefully unaddressed because women don't even know that there's a whole field out there that can help them too. So, in part, this is why I wrote and designed the structure of my book All in Her Head, the title, because so many of us have been told that our health problems are all in our head. We really go back in time and look at our current system of these 11 organ systems that we've developed. And what happens when we go back in time and we see how those systems developed and arose? And how are women left behind in the process? It's been a thousand years of holding it in. <laughs> how am I doing on time? We're good? Yeah. All right, moving on. So this is from also from the SVP report, but it helps contextualize when we think about autoimmune diseases. You know that 80% of autoimmune diseases occur in women. Do we think of it as a women's health problem? No, but why not? And what about all this other discrepancies between cardiovascular disease? 
There it is. Well, anyway, you can see it up there. Cardiovascular disease or other discrepancies that we see in medicine. Where did they really come from? And why did they become, in some instances, considered atypical? Well, the idea that women are not the reference subject included in clinical trials or included in anatomy textbooks the way that we want them to be because there's a long, rich history of seeing the female body as the atypical, imperfect version of anatomy. On the left, or on, those, on the left there, is a picture of a vagina, according to the most <laughs> famous Renaissance anatomist, Vesalius. Okay? Now, the way that he described it was, it was an inverted, imperfect penis. So go all the way back in time, ancient Greeks, and there is a long history of referring to women's anatomy as just a sucked in version of the man's because they get to have it expelled and you know out there in the open, but we're all tucked in there. So is it really that surprising that it took till 2005 to actually map that the clitoris is not just some tiny little nub, right? So that's that's this was um, from a famous female urologist who actually mapped it and did some 3D mod um, modeling of what it actually looks like. That was certainly not in any of the textbooks that I had in medical school. Dr. Harper can weigh in on this as well. Dr. Harper can get to, you know, our resident OB guides over here. So then when we think about this notion that we're imperfect, well, how did that relate to other things like heart disease? There's William Osler on the left. He's one of the most famous founding fathers of American medicine in the residency program at Hopkins. Well, I did a lot of reading of his original text on heart disease. This is what he said about women. The patient was evidently very neurotic, he's describing the patient in particular. No heart disease, no increased tension, no sclerosis of the vessels. Her heart spasms were caused by excitement and emotion. The extreme rarity of true angina, chest pain, in women must always be borne in mind. And then every case history that he has, not a single woman actually had heart disease, according to him. They were all just crazy. But mm -hmm. men, it is not the delicate neurotic person who is prone to angina, but the robust, vigorous mind and body the keen and ambitious man, the indicator of whose engines is always a pulse to him. A well-set man from 45 to 55 years of age, with a military bearing, iron and gray hair, and the glory of the TV shows the guy at work is stressed out and feels over. We don't think of the woman who can actually have a heart attack, too. We know that that happens and is almost another one for women. So heart attack syndrome. When I was in medical school, we learned that the symptoms that women experience, Dr. Morgan, wherever she is, we talk about this with heart disease, we're taught that the women's symptoms are atypical. So why are we atypical if we're greater than 50% of the population? That's simply ridiculous. <laughs> what about our mental health, right? This is just one example. I got a whole chapter on this. This was Henry Cotton in the 1920s. He was one of the most famous psychiatrists of the time. New York Times wrote about him. At the state hospital under his brilliant leadership, there's on foot the most searching, aggressive, and profound scientific investigation that has been yet been made of the whole field of mental and nervous disorders. There is hope, I hope, for the future. So what did he do? Well, he had this brilliant idea that when he noticed that when people were had an infection, they sometimes hallucinated. So women must be crazy because they have like these focal infections. Five minutes, we got it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be even less than that. Um, these focal infections. And where were these infections? In their teeth. So for these women that were being thrown into asylums for sexual desire, having different political views, whatever was making them crazy, well, let's forcibly remove their teeth. So many of these thousands of women had their teeth removed. Husbands would bring them to this famous hospital, you gotta cure my crazy wife. They would have all their teeth removed, whether they needed to or not. And if that didn't work, he had a whole chart of the other organs that he would start removing, whether it was the ovaries or pieces of the colon or the gallbladder. Now, of course, he claimed an 85% cure rate, and really there was a 30% mortality rate. Think about how these women suffered. And now in the 1940s, we were obsessively doing lobotomies on women more so than men, many of whom died from the procedure or had irreversible brain damage. This is sticking an ice, like an ice cake through the eye socket to sever ties in the frontal lobe. What about the tranquilizers, the anti-anxiety meds of the 1960s, predominantly marketed towards women? You can't set her free, but you can help her feel more anxious. Now she can cook breakfast again. What about the battle of syndrome? Well, let's just give her some reassurance and knock her out. 
So let's think about today. I'm not devaluing that some women really need to be on antidepressants, but are we really diagnosing everything that's, that they might need help with? Maybe Mark Curry can tell us that they have IBS. Maybe they have menopausal symptoms that could be treated in other ways, but we're just thinking, oh, you're, you're sad. Let's give you some. And we know that women are marketed towards much more dramatically than men. 82% of antidepressant advertisements feature women alone. Why is that? What are we missing? All right, got to tell you, if I only have three minutes left, got to tell you about bicycle face. Women and exercise. I love to exercise, okay? You might, if you wanted to ride a bicycle at the turn of the 19th century, look at this woman. You're going to be stuck with this horrible condition. You're going to be stuck with a grimace on your face. One of the biggest debates at the turn of the century was this term called bicycle face. You ride a bike, you're, oh, women only, your face is going to be frozen and you're going to look grotesque. Why? <laughs> Because more doctors became the moral arbiters of what you could do in society as a woman. Because the bike was also the symbol of the suffragist movement and freedom from your home. So when Cambridge University started to allow women and the men began to protest, they protested by putting an effigy of a woman on a bike and hanging it outside a building. Hmm. So think about the female athlete today. Hmm. What are we missing there? I tore my ACL when I was 14 years old and my doctor said to me, See if you become active over time. It was five years later before I actually had a bad fall and had it finally repaired. But concussions in female athletes, concussions in domestic violence patients, we miss these all the time. But yet we've got football protocols and helmets up the wazoo to protect our football players, which we should, but we need to be protecting women as well. So we are starting to identify the gaps, right? We know that women's health disease is autoimmune disease, a brain health lung cancer, cardiovascular disease that kills more women than all these cancers combined. And yet we don't do enough to help women in these fields. And we know from Women's Health Acts Matters, where are you? There you go. That there is not, it's not just the right thing to do because it's the ethical just thing to do, but that it will redound to productivity in our society. We invest $350 million to generate a $14 billion economic return and improve the global workforce. So there's lots of momentum this year. I'm so thrilled, thank you, for the White House contingent and Dr. Missouri here today, that it isn't just society, it isn't just women saying this, but government, politics, the White House are now taking the action that we know we need to take. So I started off by saying I'm a doctor. I'm really not very good at finance or law or other these other fields, but you in this room are. We know that there were countless other people that wanted to join us. Some of you, many of you in this room are real bosses in your fields. You've done things way harder than most people could ever do. But I ask that we start with the mindset and changing the mindset. Think about yourself. Think about the questions that you wish you'd asked your doctor or relationship you wish you could have with your health. You have the privilege now of thinking about that. And even more so with all of your power and all of your agency is we need more than just doctors to affect this change. We need people in government and finance and biotech to change the way we come to the table and think about the questions that can move the needle in women's health. So I ask you and I challenge you to think about how we can change this for the world. I'm so grateful for your time and I'm excited for the panelists to come. Okay, Elizabeth, thank you very much for that um, incredibly insightful talk. I think we all learned a huge amount, and I think you are arguably the first person who's taken a such deep look at the history of women's health and. This is definitely going to educate us in terms of how we take action moving forward. So thank you very much for that. 
And I want to thank um, everybody here for, for being here today. And um, I guess apologize to people who we couldn't accommodate uh, to be in this room. And uh, Skip and Catherine have been a fantastic partner to the graduate process on behalf of Jim Morgan and uh, partnering with us to have this opportunity. Um, they have promised me that we will have a room that will accommodate 500 people next year. <laughs> Be in the basement. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, but really, this is this is really an opportunity for us. We're we're really a pair for for turning some, some things over. So, without further ado, I am thrilled uh, to have had the opportunity to partner with really um, eight terrific panelists that you're going to hear from today. Um, and we're going to tackle some big topics in a very short amount of time. And the goal is to identify learnings, but importantly, identify action um, that many of us can take. And here's the, the punchline. It's going to take a collaboration across many of us. We all wear very different hats. And without collaboration across public, private sector, this is not going to take off. So if we really want to accelerate it, it's going to require that. We all work in teams every single day, so this should not be so hard. <laughs> okay, so let's start with panel one. We are focusing on the, the shifting paradigm in investing in women's health. And we're going to tackle it from a few angles. So before we dive in, I'm going to ask each panelist just to spend a few seconds <laughs> introducing yourselves, and then we'll dive in. So Mark, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Tina, and thank for all of you and with your enthusiasm for uh, this subject. Uh, so I've been in biotech and uh, biopharma for over 30 years. Um, I've been involved with the development of drugs that uh, treat pain, either mus uh, muscular skeletal pain or uh, visceral pain in particular IVF. I've also discovered three hormones that regulate blood pressure and fluid regulation throughout the body. Uh, and all of those things have brought me different experiences in particular places uh, relative to this particular, uh, particular topic, ranging from working with the FDA, working with uh, leading uh, clinicians in the field, uh, and also, most important, being able to actually talk to the patient and help them translate what they feel into real instruments that can be used for drug approval. I'm going to ask each of you to just spend one sentence. Why are you here today? Why did you Why did you accept my invitation? Uh, uh, one is I am great friends with you. Yeah, we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other one is I have four granddaughters, uh, and I've seen way too much over the years of women being treated the way Liz just described. Got to stop. Yeah, Carly. Well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this invitation to be here and and for your amazing comment. And obviously for quoting uh, the work that we commissioned the Brand Corporation to do, which is, we think, rather profound. So my background is not 30 years in this field, although I did serve on the Breast Cancer uh, Research Foundation board from the time that it started uh, for 25 years. And that gave me a pretty good grounding in terms of research, understanding how a not-for-profit could grow from the um, very small beginnings to a very significant force. And also uh, to understanding cost marketing, not for profit structure and all the rest. My background is in business um, and I had the uh, great pleasure of building a global brand. So I understand how businesses are built. I understand how they're sold. Um, but more importantly, I also understand how the teams, as Christina was saying, uh, can have a, a tremendous impact. WAM was started by a group of friends of mine who are business women with the idea that there had to be a better way to talk about all of these different issues and the fact that women were such an understudied, underrepresented uh, part of society. And how could that be? After all, we are 52% of the population, we're 51% of the workforce, we own 60% of the wealth in the country, we make 85% of the spending decisions and 80% of the healthcare decisions. We're not a niche market. <laughs> um, and we do drive economies. So how does that work then? If women are healthy and well, society is healthy and well. And so we sat around the table and thought, okay, there's got to be a better way to talk about this because the way it had been talked about for 30 years, and at least in talking to many researchers, um, was uh, more, in my opinion, more emotional 
uh, more anecdotal and less factual. And so we wanted to have some data. And as business people, we know that uh, data creates change. And that was when we engaged the Rand Corporation, asked them a simple question. How could we impact uh, the health of women? And would it change if research was accelerated? And what would that look like? Let's talk about yeah. Well, we'll get the punchline in a second. I'm going to come to you first. Uh, Jane. Um, <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Jane Morgan. I'm a cardiologist from Atlanta. I'm actually a nuclear and pacemaker trained cardiologist who then transitioned over into research and worked for a number of years at Abbott and Solvay, really in hard labor, R&D, developing drugs, developing devices. Um, in structural heart space, in the cardiorenal space. Um, I then began to lead a uh, big study site at a huge medical facility here in Atlanta, called the, uh, in Atlanta called Piedmont Healthcare, largest healthcare system um, in Georgia, 22 medical campuses, with the largest employer uh, in the state of Georgia, uh, over 50,000 employees, was leading a huge uh, research site. And one of the things that I was concerned about was that I didn't see rural patients in my trials. I wasn't seeing females in my trials. I wasn't seeing minorities in my trials. And so I began to really advocate to try to find out why this is. Um, I've recently um, written a book. I don't know if you'll ever see it. Publishers haven't gotten back to me, but let me just tell you all the What chapters are sent out to you might not see it? I call it the big extrapolation. And this is clinical trials where we enroll all of these men then the FDA approves data on all of these men, and then we extrapolate it to everybody else. <laughs> and I think you've heard that women are majority of the population. Well, think about these big drug companies, and I worked for one of them. These are global companies. <laughs> the white population is about 90% of the entire global population. Now think about the men who are enrolled in the trial. But these drugs and devices are going out to the entire world. I have I have labeled that the big extrapolation, where a tiny slice, a sliver of the population gets really good health care, and the rest of us just, you know, we're just going to juggle it and figure it out. And so that is really how I have dedicated a good part of my life to focusing on what that means, and also specifically from a cardiovascular perspective, specifically in the development and aging of the person, but also the aging of the woman. What is that aging process? How does it change from a cardiac standpoint? And what kinds of things should we be aware of, should we be doing, including flu shots and talk about why flu shots are very specifically important to women and heart disease. And all of these are very important. So hopefully I'll get a chance to, to talk about that. Good morning. I'm Dr. Lindsay Harper. I'm an OBGYN and I was um, in private practice. I've been an OBGYN for 15 years. And in my experience, I started to put a few things together, kind of like Dr. Komen, that patients were really needing help, particularly my area is in their sexual health. If you think women's health is taboo, you should investigate women's sexual health. Um, it is much more taboo. And I became quite angry about that. The fact that, you know, men's sexual health was getting a lot of funding, a lot of attention started a company called Rosie, um, and now we really exist to fill in the gaps. We fill in the gaps for physicians and healthcare providers and also patients when it comes to changing our experience and expanding the, the physician and nurse practitioner and nurses' ability to really address women's health issues from a holistic and whole person perspective. Um, and I'm here really to, you know, obviously speak on behalf on the entrepreneurs in women's health. There's so many in this audience, there's so many watching, and we are so extremely dedicated to this field and so excited for all of the, the, the discussions that are happening. So thanks for the invitation. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. And I failed to say that I'm Christina Isaacson, <laughs> a partner at Lightstone Ventures. Um, we are an early stage venture capital firm and have made um, several investments in the women's health space, in particular on the device side. Um, and we are very eager to make more uh, in the device the world as well as the pharmaceutical world. Okay, so with that, Caroline, I'm going to start with you. You highlighted um, the economic analysis that uh, you spearheaded. And I think it's really important for this audience to hear the outcome of that analysis, in particular, um, 
you know, the fact that your report essentially found that $14 billion ROI could come to the economy simply by doubling. My short statement, you 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 teach us now. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was that simple. Um, here's what's interesting, I think, about it is if you get a group and you were talking earlier about having different kinds of people sitting around a table to come up with ideas. This, this idea came about because um, many of us just couldn't understand why change was not happening in this area. And uh, so what, what we decided to do was to host a series of different meetings with many researchers, um, and Carolyn included, and for whom I am an eternally grateful, actually, because she was the first person who I brought a lot of my data to to say, is this really true? It's like, do women really have Alzheimer's twice as frequently as men? Are they really two thirds of the population? Is autoimmune disease eighty percent of the population? All these different data points. It's like, how's all this possible? And no one knows, mm -hmm. or so few people know. That was, I think, the other thing that we were struck by is how little known uh, the, the data was. So we had a, a couple of different things that occurred to us. One was this is a communication problem. And that, most of what I think we all are involved with is a communication problem. So first of all, how do we convey these messages of that you know, these are inequities? It is, it is about social uh, justice and it is about inequities, but but how do I change that? Because I don't I don't want to go back to looking at the ads of Lysol. I, I want to figure out, I do from a historical point of view, but I really want to figure out to your point, is kind of move it forward. And so we we looked at four different disease areas and talking with the Rand Corporation to be engaged because we thought, well, we're going to need someone to help us ferret out if there is an economic impact. What does that look like? Who can help us figure that out? Who can create micro simulation models in which these are that would show us what the potential return might be? Because remember, all this is might. I mean, I, I don't think it's as simple as let's double that number and we get this return. But clearly, there's something there that we need to explore. And so, the four areas that we picked were uh, brain, uh, were cancer, uh, autoimmune, uh, heart health, and cardiovascular disease. And and what we realized is that these areas were going to affect what in their lifetime. And when you looked at the data, um, it was pretty scary. And again, some of it has been pointed out um, of how heart disease uh, affects women differently and how many of these, these diseases affect women differently, uh, uh, exclusively, predominantly. And what does that look like? And how do we analyze that? And then we looked at the amount of investment by NIH in each of these numbers. Which I'm not going to get into the, the actual numbers because I'm not sure you can, you can go out to lamnow.org and see all that. But what's important is that, again, if we are 52% of the population, there's a misfit. We're not investing 52% um, or even close to it in some of these uh, disease areas uh, to, uh, to improve the lives of women. And, and so I think, uh, you know, what, what we were very focused on was. What would that return be? What, first of all, what was that number? And that number was 350 million in those four disease categories of what NIH invests in studying women. And if you were to double that number, that's the $14 billion return that would come to the economy. Um, what we were very excited by was that a large number of um, women in Congress also jumped all over this. Uh, Tammy Duckley, Jan Duchowski uh, issued um, uh, uh, a proposal uh, to Congress. Um, and uh, so a resolution to Congress. And so that now is floating around. Uh, Liz is helping us uh, try to figure out how to make this a more efficient process. I certainly am not um, a DC-based person. Um, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an economist. Uh, I am a business person. And so that's the that's the filter by which I'm looking at. Fantastic, that's uh, I mean, incredibly impactful, right? Because I think the economic analysis is what's gonna drive a lot of the investment decision making. And so everybody needs to understand there is an economic benefit. What it has done, which is which I'm thrilled by um, and delighted by, is it has changed the conversation. Yeah. And that was the objective. And I think in many of these different uh, issues that we're uh, dealing with, how do we change the conversation? What kind of data creates change? What kind of data do we need? What kind of stories are surrounding that data? That can actually help the change. That's great. That is a good segue, actually. To I wanted to ask Jane uh, next set of questions here. Um, and talk a little bit about um, you know you're a long-standing uh, cardiologist. You've taken care of a lot of patients. Share a little bit about your observations with women, in particular, you've cared for how age 
the opportunity to meet around aging. You, you've alluded to this. And then let's tie that a little bit to action, right? How can we do a better job of generating data that is relevant to a broader set of people? That broader set being the majority of the population. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I talk about training in medical school, right? And we are trained uh, in medical school about symptoms of cardiology and the symptoms are you know, crushing chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, meaning sweating. You may feel dizzy. You may collapse. Um, and then later, I don't know when, it's some vague time, you learn about atypical. There's some atypical presentations of heart disease. You've got to become a cardiologist to understand the atypical. You've got to do a fellowship <laughs> before you learn the atypical symptoms. <laughs> and these atypical symptoms are, you know, sometimes jaw pain, um, that might send you to the dentist to, to maybe check out a tooth, or you might just be tired and run down, um, or you may just have cold and flu symptoms that you just can't shake, um, or a nagging back pain. Interestingly, a lot of these symptoms are presentations of women, and women not only overlook the symptoms of the physicians, overlook the symptoms as well and dismiss them as other things because these are somewhat vague and they can be attributed to a lot of other um, symptoms. But the problem is we attach the lexicon of atypical to these symptoms. So already the way that you think about it, the way that you internalize it is that this is a, a deviation from the normal something that is an aberration, something that is not something that is commonly seen. It is atypical, something in addition that you have to learn. You won't actually be tested on it, but if you have some injury, you can learn about these atypical symptoms. And so what happens? We see that oftentimes women, when they have their first heart attack, is more often fatal than that of a man. Why? because our symptoms have gone on for such a long period of time undiagnosed. And if you think there's no data behind that, when we survey primary care physicians, more than 40% of them admit that they do not feel comfortable managing a woman with heart disease. And interestingly, 22% of cardiologists don't even feel comfortable. And if you think about that, that makes sense because the majority of cardiologists are men. And there is not a comfort level with this. And so these atypical symptoms, we've got to begin to change the jargon because it matters. It influences how we think and it influences how we act. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. I was leading the COVID task force during the height of COVID for the Piedmont healthcare system, largest <laughs> employer, largest healthcare system in the state of Georgia, we lost over a million people, even at the height of COVID, it still did not dethrone heart disease as the number one killer. Mm. Heart disease never got knocked off its pedestal. We remained the queens. <laughs> and so we have to understand how important that is. Women's risk of heart disease is half that of a man's prior to menopause, during your reproductive years. That is because of the protective effects of estrogen. Estrogen has anti-inflammatory properties. We now understand heart disease as part of an inflammatory process, like many other processes in our bodies. But as we go through menopause, our risk of heart disease begins to equal that of men. And then by the time we're 70, it actually surpasses that of men. But we still are not being identified with heart disease. And so all of these are areas of interest of mine. As we look at the aging woman, we can talk about as well pregnancy, pregnancy complications, how those move on to increase your risk of heart disease without you knowing it, without a referral to a cardiologist. You can then enter menopause with this elevated risk of heart disease from a pregnancy complication. And now your estrogen levels are dropping. Your cardiac risk is further increasing. So you can see how this all starts to, be, to collide. Um, as we age, and it's completely you know, ignored for the most part. Um, and I think, you know, Dr. Coleman did a great job of, uh, you know, I, I call it the there, there. You come in and you kind of get patted on the back, there, there. It'll all be fine. Take this antidepressant. In fact, 
antidepressant <laughs> prescriptions double during menopause, <laughs> interestingly, yeah. for women. Um, and that's the there, there effect. We're not actually being treated for what's happening. Well, I think what you're highlighting as well, and I think I, I want to go to Mark from here because I want to highlight another disease area, and that's the gastrointestinal um, disease area. Elizabeth, you've done a great job. You, you really set us up here at the, in the talk. Women's health is not just about breast and ovaries, right? You said this is not bikini medicine. Your chapters, organ by organ by organ, you are describing what is unique for women or disproportionately represented by women. And I think that's a really important point. That's a good sort of segue to Mark. So Mark, while you were spearheading research and development at Ironwood Pharmaceuticals, you had discovered a novel area of biology, novel hormone, that could have potential pain impact, anti-pain impact, and potentially impact on constipation in the context of irritable bowel, which is a, I think, 70% female predominant disease. What's cool about this story is that this was novel biology, right? Novel research, novel insights, applied in the context of a disease where you have predominantly women who are affected, but yet you had to navigate a path forward, right? You had to develop language. You had to learn from the patients. You had to develop a, a, a development path and partner with the FDA. So tell us a bit about that journey. And I want to paint this very much as a success story. And I think um, we're going to then talk to Lindsay about her product. This is really important for all of us because these success stories talk about how we can overcome some of the challenges and then all the different entities it requires to get there. So tell us, tell us about that, Mark. Is that working? Yeah. That was... yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I take you back a little bit, though, one of the first drugs I worked on was uh, muscular skeletal pain. And back then, you scored the pain levels of the patient uh, from what the physician's point of view was. They helped create the scale. You didn't go to the patient to get the scale. You went to the physician leaders in the field. And they said, this is how the patient will tell you pain. The big transformation came in the FDA uh, really indicated we've got to get to the patient. It's not the physician telling them, telling us what the pain is. Let's get to the patient and ask them, what are your symptoms? How would you describe it? How can you, you know, what are the measurement scales that really can translate? So we spent a lot of time trying to work through getting instruments, interviewed with patients, narrowing that down, going back to the patient, getting that verification of, is this a useful way to describe your abdominal pain? Nobody had ever done that with abdominal pain before. And it was a real partnership and an eye opener for me uh, because you know it was a totally new area for us in developing these patient reported outcomes and being able to go to those interviews personally, sit with the patient in a very you know open way that would tell us what was going on. Mark, this beyond pain. It's, Were there things like yeah so, floating? So it's, um, and then when you think about a disease like that impacts the gastrointestinal system, you know, it, there's so many symptoms, right? Uh, they definitely was constipation for these patients, bloating, um, cramping, uh, on down the list. And uh, the, again, taking all of that into consideration and trying to put together an instrument that we could use for those patients. Uh, and it was a real negotiation along the way. But what always came back, and I was very impressed uh, with the regulators that you pointed with, what won the day was data from the patient, not the, the physician, what were the patient's face. Uh, and I, you know, for us now, like we out, we're out there always looking for these diseases now where we can help the patient take that, their experiences and translate it into something that you can perform. Um, so, uh, you know, then going to, further into the gastrointestinal space, uh, you know, for us, um, being able to take this drug forward for patients and hearing the patient's response of how this drug works for them, right? No drug works for every patient, but having those patients that really responded and come back to us and tell us, these, it did make a difference on these symptoms. This is a disease that when you look at the impact on the patient's life, 
it will basically take very often it drives people, uh, uh, young women, typically when they go off, uh, change their environment a lot of times, they go to college or go to a new work environment. But there's that component there that then initiates the disease. And all of a sudden, they withdraw socially. They often drop out of school, a lot of these patients. They often have difficulty at work. Disease that, work, that is actually working on these, impacting these patients almost every day of their lives. Huge impact when we looked at the, the impact on their family, on their job, on interacting with their friends. So the next part of this, though, is who I think we ought to be talking about a great deal is the payer. So the payer comes back, right, and says, well, this, and they don't tell you, but it's basically, I think it, this is a women's disease. They're largely women. The value is this. And you look at it and you say, oh, well, it seems like we're having a huge impact on improving patient lives. And you're rewarding the innovator with this much. But if I go back and look at drugs that improve erectile dysfunction, they gave a much bigger reward, right? And I think that comes back to how we invest in women's uh, health is that you have to go further upstream and the payer plays such a critical role. And all the major payers that I know of that uh, have the person who really makes the decision on what they're gonna pay for a drug, most of those are men. So, you know, there's work to be done, I think, on taking this and making it much more. And, you know, why would it, you have a. So, did your, did your, did your data, did you, was there negotiation? Absolutely. Uh, and, and how did that go? Yeah. Um, so, of course, we got uh, some reward. I would say it's frustrating when you look and you think, oh, we're making such a big difference in these patients' lives. And yet, we look at some of the other areas that I feel very comfortable saying, if this had been mostly a male disease, I think the pricing would have been much more favorable for us. And again, not I'm thrilled that we have the drug out at an over 5 million patients now. But what I think is most important is that feeds back to what pharma and biotech will invest in. They will invest in things that give them the biggest reward. And if the payer is saying this is not something we're going to reward you much for compared to something else that is perhaps uh, more of a male-oriented disease, I, I think there's a natural outcome. You're not going to see as many yeah. venture firms, you're not going to see by uh, the big pharmaceutical companies investing in this area. And that's why I think you often see women's health diseases are often spun out of pharma, right? Both of those are not internal involvement or they spun them out and they don't put much investment. Yeah. Although you guys were able to partner with a large appointment, Kevin Sports Labs, which has since changed names multiple times, but that was post having phase 2 data, right? So you had a pretty substantial package. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and certainly we've had great partners. Uh, we're now partnering with Abby. Uh, and it's, you know that partnership is going great. But yeah, I think it's that. You have to, when we first started uh, working an idea, we got told many of the things that Elizabeth talked about. This is a stress disease, not a GI disease. It's anxiety, it's depression. Well, it turned out that, you know, and we went and talked to the, the leading experts in the field and said, what if we treat the gut? Forget the brain for a minute. If we treat the gut, will the brain get better? Because these patients do have anxiety and depression. Guess what? If you were hit in the stomach every yeah. day, you've had a meal. Yeah. You thought to get anxious and depressed. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, we all of a sudden saw in that scale across the board uh, that if they if a patient did have anxiety and depression with IBS, they got better. Their scores always improved. So we pitched that it's a GI disease fundamentally that's feeding back into the gut brain act. Right. Well, let's switch to a different kind of product. So, um, Lindsay, as a physician entrepreneur, we're going to hone in on your entrepreneur side here, represented here on the panel. And so, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your product, Rosie? And in particular, I would like to understand um, kind of uh, your process to establish it, what inspired it. You, you kind of touched on that in your introduction. But then what was the path to where you are today? And then 
what are the hurdles you're actively overcoming right now? Okay, thank you. I'll try to keep it short, but that's, that's <laughs> exciting to, to, to talk about. So as I mentioned, when I was in private practice, literally every single day, many times a day, patients were coming to me with sexual health complaints. And I had zero, I'm telling y'all, zero training when it comes to women's sexual health. And even for me, fundamentally, I had to define what I was even talking about. Am I talking about STIs? No, I can handle an STI in our sleep. I'm talking about orgasm, arousal, lubrication, and desire, right? We have a very clear understanding of what sexual dysfunction is in men, but we never think about these frameworks in women. And that's because it's missing from our training. And instead, the narratives that are passed down to us from well-meaning, well-respected, lovely physicians are drink a glass of wine yeah. or go on vacation or get a new partner or have, maybe have your partner do the dishes. And it's like, wait, what? Is this what we're telling men on the ED side? Absolutely not. We understand there's a fundamental component of health when it relates to sexuality. And that narrative is completely missing from the field of women's health, the health of women. And that really made me so angry, not only for my patients, but also for me that I was showing up to work every day and these were my terrible answers, right? And so I went and became, you know, much more uh, of an expert on the topic and, and completed um, training in specifically in women's sexual health. And I learned, hey, there are evidence-based interventions. It's that we are not, we don't ever talk about them. Physicians don't know about them. Patients don't even know that these things can be addressed from med a medical perspective. So we're all hanging out in silence and shame and not getting our issues addressed. And I, I think that it's important for me to point out that I'm talking about women's sexual health, but you can take any of the words that I'm saying and extrapolate them to every other area of the health of women and they apply. This silence and shame and embarrassment because of the there, there reaction that we experience as physicians to our patients and there, and we also experience and sort of pass on to our patients, unfortunately, as well. And it's because there's just a fundamental lack of narrative, representation, you know, acknowledgement of these specific types. So long story short, I wanted to not only, you know, make a difference in my community, but hopefully more broadly in the country, in the world, in the medical community and amongst patients. So it started Rosie, which is a platform which really offers whole person, page, patient centric care. And much like Mark was saying, I think it's so important in the area of the health of women that we go directly to the woman. We don't ask the researchers. We don't ask the doctors. We talk to women who are experiencing these health conditions because we can chase an interesting protein in the lab all day long. But if that doesn't apply to my health needs as a woman, I think it's such an opportunity for those of us in the room funding and inventing and innovating to say, what is it that women actually need? And how can we how can we take this moment in time as a beacon for all of healthcare and go to the patient and ask them what they need in terms of innovation, in terms of research? And so that's really what we are what we are doing at Rosie. We're offering the physician the support that she needs because she doesn't have any time. We all know that she has seven to 10 minutes with her patient. She wants to do better, but unfortunately we are extremely time bound. So Rosie's the digital health platform that lets the, the physician, you know, do a better job of offering whole person support to the patient and then gives the patient the evidence-based uh, support and care that she needs. And did you have to interact with the FDA at all for your program? Yeah. So fun that we talked about this in our prep call, but I knew um, going into this as a physician that unfortunately um, payers don't care about women's sexual health at all. Like we're not getting reimbursed as physicians for women's sexual health visits. We're coding under other codes to get paid for those visits. The two FDA prescriptions that exist for low sexual desire are not reimbursed by uh, payers. So I didn't have any, you know, wild idea that they're going to fund or pay for a digital health intervention for women's sexual health. I just never and still don't believe that that's possible. So we went direct to consumer as many business models in women's health are set up because we hear the women, we are the women, we know there is a need and we look at the landscape of how to be reimbursed for these things and those pathways don't exist. And that's the job of the people in this room is to correct that imbalance, right? How can we take the agency that we have given to patients to find these own interventions and, and, and have our healthcare systems that we are all investing in pay for those innovations for women? We have to take the responsibility off of individuals. So I, I think there's a future path, but you know, this is a long game and, and there has to be some fundamental change. So listen, we're gonna have to close here, but I'm gonna ask every panelist. You have 15 seconds <laughs> each. What do you each recommend 
in 2024 <laughs> as one key change to drive more innovation in women's health. So you all wear different hats. So, and if you have to repeat something you already said, that's okay. <laughs> Mark. Yeah, I, I think the, the key for me at least is the pair. They control so much of our healthcare system. So putting pressure on the health pair to recognize how impactful women's diseases are. Uh, not only for you know, the women themselves, their families, and society. Well, uh, I, I've been uh, very fortunate to have amazing partners, and um, Brand certainly was one of the partners in creating uh, the LAM report, which is now widely cited, widely used. And uh, when we started to think about the investment community, we wondered if such a report might be helpful. And so one of our consulting partners is now working with us to create that report, which we hope all of you will be the beneficiaries of, and which we hope you will contribute your ideas uh, to, because we want to ask the same question that we asked about research. What would the economic impact be if we were to accelerate investment? Uh, in women's companies and focused on women's health. And that is exactly what we'll do now. Awesome. Jane. Inclusion in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really where everything starts is the, blinds, uh, the blind spot for physicians. We are trained to treat what's FDA approved. We really never look behind the curtain to see how it got there. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to start to understand the importance of clinical trials. Why is it important for us to be included? In those clinical trials, why it's important for FDA approved data to be relevant to you and not to someone else, why that extrapolation is dangerous or why it's, it's done a disservice to you. So we've got to begin to understand how clinical trials actually translate to better health and that women's health is not just the reproductive system. Women's health is everything, how we experience disease and what that means. And clinical trials is really where it starts. We've got to begin to understand the importance. Yeah, I have a chip on my shoulder that women's health is not a charity. Um, I you know, think that it's up to all of us to prove that women's health is an investable business that we should all be excited about getting into. And I think that there's an opportunity with you know the government being involved to incentivize private investors and their investment in women's health Help and really spur that innovation that needs to be happening. So I'd love to see that as moving forward. Fantastic. So I think we have time for maybe like one, maybe two questions, depending on how deep the questions are from the audience. But yes. So first of all, thank you all for your service and for your work. Um, Let me give you my microphone. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to bring this up because I know that um, at least Lindsay um, and a lot of others are going to that, um, uh, resonate. But well, part of the challenge as an investor is that you want to make sure that the product is able to be sold and able to be advertised. And what I'm hearing from a lot of entrepreneurs, as you all know, is that a lot of these um, uh, companies can't even get their um, ads on social media, which is a big part of especially if you're going to see. So you want to speak to that? Yes, I'd love to speak to that. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so I just want to call out the work of the Centers for Intimacy Justice. If y'all are not familiar, please become familiar. They're amazing. They have done so much important work um, at raising awareness of these issues that we all face. So if I'm in women's sexual health, which I agree is a special circumstance, but women's health ads, generally speaking, if we're looking at urinary incontinence, if we're looking at menopause, things that have nothing to do with sex, we'll, we'll treat mine as a special circumstance, are banned from advertising on Meta, Google. Right now, we cannot advertise in the Apple App Store. So I just want everyone who's not aware to be aware that even though Meta has changed their policies, the, the algorithms have not changed the, the way that they work. And what happens is when you're in a startup with a small ads account under a million dollars, you do not have the representation to have anything corrected. So you're building a D2C business, growth is happening, you're you know having a great talk with investors, all of a sudden your ads get banned and you're no longer able to speak to customers. So if we do not create the ecosystem in which we are able to communicate about this in rooms like this, but also directly to the women that need us, we will never see you know, the, the success of these companies that needs to happen. Good morning. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful 
full panel. My name is Dr. Diana Ramos, and I am the California Surgeon General, and I am inspired by what you're doing. I'm also an OBGYN by training, so this panel really resonates. And my question is, is how can we as government collaborate more with all of you? Because it really is a cross-collaboration, as was mentioned earlier by Christina, that is going to be the key, because there are some things that I can say that maybe can't be said by others. And so this is where we leverage each other's skills and ability to speak. So I would love to hear it. Great. I'll take a step. I mean, I think conversations like this, if there can be dedicated time where we can sit in a room and problem solve together, I think that's the most meaningful place to start because there's so many creative entrepreneurs, there's so many great solutions, and we need a you know a place to kind of get them out. So I think conversations are the very first place to start. Thank you so much. I'll add to that with social media, you know, outside of advertising just influencers who can talk, build their outside the meta platform and begin to engage these kinds of people who will start to bring um, eyes and visibility <clears throat> and interest and concern and followers. So that may be a way to think about how we start to socialize this information. Because as I've said, the lexicon is important, yep. the language that we're using and how it's being translated. And, I, and one other recommendation, which is to create more PFAS, private economic public partnerships, which I think bringing members of the different different segments of the ecosystem together to create uh, new ideas, to create change is probably very much needed. Great. Okay, with that, the last panel wants to step down. Uh,